minutes. Okay, so today I'm talking to Charles Vincent Burwell. Um, I know him as Vince. I've known him for many, 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 many years. <laughs> and we go way back. Um, so let me read a little bit of the bio, which is very impressive. I'll try to jump around because it's also really long. Um, he has long felt that diversity and creative identity were instrumental in fashioning a well-rounded artist. Um, he began his musical training with the piano at age seven, and by the onset of his teenage years, he learned to play most brass instruments and was beginning to work on compositions. A congressional scholar in leadership, he received a BS in choral vocal music education from Florida A&M University, which is where I know him from. And then he went on um, to study at NYU, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And then um, you've worked with, as a dancer, um, with Orcasis, which was the Contemporary Dance Theater at uh, Florida a &M. You've also been a, an accompanist for the Florida State University Department of Dance. That was way back. And yeah. since then, you've worked with um, Lincoln Center Institute, City Center, the Catherine Dunham Institute, Trenton Educational um, Dance Institute, National Dance Institute, Urban Bush Women, Festival de, del Caribe, sorry if that was wrong. Um, and I will pronounce this wrong, I'm so, I wish I could. But anyway, in Brazil, Bates Dance Festival, Jacob's, Phillip, Jacob's Pillow, um, Cairo Opera House Ballet, you compose music for them. Um, also for Jacques D'Amboise in Shanghai, China. We sang at Carnegie Hall. And um, there's a lot. Yes, Alvin Ailey, a longtime member of the faculty and music staff at the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. So um, proud member of the Dramatist Guild of America, the National Alliance of Musical Theater, and charter member of Omicron Gamma Chapter of Phi Mu Alpha Symphonia Professional Music, music Fraternity. And that was at Florida a &M. So, um, hey, thanks for taking time. I know you're very busy um, these days doing all kinds of stuff. So, um, well, first of all, let me talk a little bit before I get to you as a musician. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the moment because I know that you are back in, in Jersey City at the Clever Agency, which I'll get to as well. And um, that you were in Hampton, Virginia for a while at your with your family at your family home, mm -hmm. sheltering in place, having escaped New York City just in time. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, as you're seeing things happening around you, and of course, Virginia is a very important historical state and in, in um, I mean, all states are important in American history, but you know, a lot of stuff happened in Virginia. And um, what are you seeing um, in this moment? And like, what, a bit, what were your experiences while you were there? In Virginia growing up, or, or when I was down there just recently, um, you know, being a New Yorker, and I've been in New York now longer than I've been anywhere. I've been in New York, been in the New York uh, tri-state area for uh, roughly. This will be my twentieth year, so uh, so it's always a bit of a culture shock going back to Virginia, going back essentially home, and um, so it takes me a while to slow down and slow down my pace, and um, and appreciate the, the the culture that's there. Um, Obviously, Virginia has a very interesting history and has played a very pivotal role in um, in his in history. Uh, and a lot of those a lot of those wounds uh, still exist, um, yeah. or the scab is still there. That's still in the healing process. I would say like that. Um, so I am looking at seeing how they are evolving because what with what's going on, particularly politically right now, socially politically, um, they kind of have to. And New York is one thing because New York is so diverse. Virginia historically has not been as diverse. And so we're, we're, they're finding out how, what the new normal is in terms mm -hmm. of culture. And, mm -hmm. um, and for a place like Virginia, which I love, um, it is pushing, pushing pretty hard um, against some very foundationally rooted uh, structures. Um, they're fighting the good fight. I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. Virginia's demographics are shifting, and the mindsets, are, the mindset is shifting, so that my New York experience and my Virginia experience aren't so uh, far apart. Okay. Well, that's quite. I mean, I, I can't. I, mean, I lived in Tallahassee, as you know, for a number of years. I can't say I've ever lived in Virginia, but I certainly lived in the South um, mm -hmm. a little bit, and so um, you know, it's just in interesting for me to read, you know, all these things and see these statues coming down and just kind of wonder where we'll be, you know, what the attitudes will be if some of these attitudes 
will be changed as these statues come down or if the people just go underground and wait for a moment to come back up or what what happens but but anyway um let's get to you more specifically and um you know just uh, jump around a little bit so i will say that when you were at florida a &M, i had no idea that you wrote music at all um you kept that on the down low so what made you decide um after you left that this was going to be the direction you were going to go um uh, wow that's a good let me think about that i i always did write music but i didn't always feel secure in it mm -hmm. um going to florida a m there was so much talent and so much ability and so much skill there mm -hmm. um uh, so my friends uh people that i saw every day um they were so good and they didn't not that they did anything to make me in, feel insecure other than being amazing mm -hmm. and so a lot of the a lot of that time i spent um think wondering uh was i good enough mm -hmm. uh, imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and um it didn't it wasn't until later in my time there that i actually started taking the risks mm -hmm. and moving to new york is a place where a lot of people whether they are good or great or not Mm -hmm. um, they take the risks. And so seeing that, moving to New York and seeing seeing that I see talent here and New York is the place to be, you know, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily rooted in talent because I've mm -hmm. seen comparable or greater talent in Tallahassee, in small mm -hmm. Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, I can do it here. And so I started putting myself out there a little bit more in terms of creating. Mm -hmm. Also, um, being able to write and create allowed me to make up for the limitations that I might have in proficiency. Because yeah. I, play a number, I, play a, I play a number of instruments and I play them okay, pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're sitting next to somebody that they've spent their entire life mastering this craft, mm -hmm. I can hand them, a, hand them a score and say, all right, make this sound good. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. So, and that's kind of what led me into back into theater, um, working with so many great artists that once you, they, involve their art with what I've created or my art, it becomes something greater than even I imagined. Mm -hmm. And so that, and that made me want to create more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It made me want to write more. So did you get accepted at NYU and then you moved to New York or you just said, I'm gonna take a chance on moving to New York and then? <laughs> oh no, I, um, I, uh, I moved to New York in, uh, and I got accepted into, I moved to New York directly after undergrad. Okay. And I got accepted into NYU about about nine years after that. Okay. There are a lot of economic. It's, it's the life of the artist, and mm -hmm. and so we make the road by walking it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I dev I moved up to New York with a U-Haul and a dream. Okay. Um, I did not have a job. Uh, my good friend, uh, close friend, frat brother, uh, Oshibi Craig, who you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oshibi had a cousin who was going back to school. And they wanted to hold on to their apartment, so I had a place to live. Okay. And so I, and that was all that I had. And I moved. I knew three people, and um, I moved to New York, and just began doing what I knew how to do. I, I could accompany. Mm -hmm. so I learned how to. I got a job as an accompanist and didn't know how to play percussion. So okay. I, didn't, I, <laughs> I didn't own a drum. Didn't any of that. But Ojibi could show you something. Ojibi could show me. Yeah. Uh, other people, the late Kwame yeah. Ross could show me. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time practicing, practicing, and I learned the dance technique. That was the other one because I knew the dance. I could, I knew the dance technique from having studied that while I was at, at Florida A&M mm -hmm. um, in orchestras. I knew intellectually what I had to create for. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a relationships thing. But mm -hmm. all of that being that I found ways to stay employed and pay, try to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, had some great moments uh, the Carnegie Hall, uh, uh, played wonderful performances, opened for some great artists mm -hmm. and uh, performed with great artists, collaborated. And then- Can you, can you, drop, can you drop some names? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I worked with our Urban Bush Women and John yeah. Lay as a friend and mentor. Yeah. Um, I've played with people that, played with a group that opened for Dave Matthews band okay. on the Dave Matthews tour. Yeah. Um, I, I, played in and around Broadway on as, as a sub for shows. Mm -hmm. um, I've created with some amazing, some amazing singers, I'm trying to think of some that come to mind. 
Um, there's a group that's out right, right now. Um, Ashanda Rules, a good friend of mine, who's one of the most greatest great singers um, that I worked with very early on. Uh, Kendra Foster, who you know, uh, two-time Grammy Award winner. Mm -hmm. um, and so a number of, of, of really wonderful group of uh, people in the arts world as well, uh, mm -hmm. dance organizations, choreographers. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and that's an up and down field. I mean, you, you, it's feast or famine. Yeah. So 9-11 happened and all of the funding went away. Yeah. So I kind of, and then a group of, and a large cadre of artists left New York mm -hmm. and I stayed. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, later on the mortgage crisis where the recession, great recession. And so at this time um, I was actually on tour with the aforementioned band um, that, opened for, that opened on the DMB tour. Um, I was passing through Tallahassee and I stopped to see Jawaleh and I'd written a kid, a children's show. And Jawale, and we were having lunch, and she said, have you ever thought about, and I actually wanted to collaborate with her, so I brought the idea to, as a collaboration, and mm -hmm. she, she responded. She never answered that question, but she responded, have you ever thought about, have you thought about grad school? And I, I said, I remember saying something along the lines of the next degree that I plan to get is honorary. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I hadn't, and so she hit me to the NYU program, Mm -hmm. And um, so I decided to check it out, and mm -hmm. um, and evidently she'd spoken, and they they had, were waiting for me to arrive. To okay. Them. And um, I went in. I fell in love with the program, and um, and it was really interesting and rekindled my love for musical theater mm -hmm. um, as a as a collaborative art form, as opposed to the the glee smash package that it had become. Yeah. And so I apologize. Um. Okay. Um. And uh, and so, yeah, I decided to continue my education there and and learn to apply these compositions to something greater. Okay. And so, and I enjoyed it, and it really expanded my mind, and it was great to be learning again and have the stakes only be messing up as opposed to I don't eat. <laughs> so I could make mistakes and learn, and we learn we learn the most by making mistakes. It's right. Growth, sure. mind, growth mindset. So, um, and so that was a really great experience. And so with that, my career pivoted in toward, towards being a composer in the more classical sense, where okay. prior I had been a, more of a songwriter. Okay, okay. Um, so was Kubamore the first full show that you wrote? Yes, Kubamore was my, was actually my MFA thesis. Okay, so, can, um, can you talk a little bit more about Kubamore? Okay, yeah, so, um, Soon after I moved to New York, I'd say this is around 2000 and <laughs> long time ago, <laughs> so, um, I uh, um, toured, I uh, toured Cuba with Oshibi and we performed. And so, uh, and we had our, you know, the, the exp that, that experience. And shortly after I returned, I met a gentleman named Joshua Bialafi, who's now a good friend. And um, he uh, had just, he had released a movie that had been his man, graduate work. Um, when he was, uh, I think, at Cal Arts, and he'd made a film. He's a filmmaker about mm -hmm. Cuba, and I watched the movie and I fell in love with it because it was so similar to my Cuban experience. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward uh, about uh, about seven or eight years. I'm in grad school, and so we we have to decide on two two uh, thesis ideas, and and put them before our board of advisors, mm -hmm. uh, my collaborator, who we got to choose and they kind of chose for us, and which which is my now writing partner and business partner, James D. Sasser. Mm -hmm. And James liked the idea of Cuba more. He saw the movie and fell in love with it too. Mm -hmm. And so I was working at Bates that summer. I was, uh, I was teaching at Bates that summer. And I decided, and so I said, well, when we get back, let's, let's look into this for our second year of grad school. Within two weeks, James had found a grant for us to go to Cuba. Wow. <laughs> my, my workshop at Bates ended to go to Cuba to do conduct research. Mm -hmm. And um, and that really fostered my love of research, continued to foster my growth in enjoying the research process. Mm -hmm. And we went back to Cuba again and to see how it had changed since I'd been there mm -hmm. and to create the worlds for our characters and the soundscape and listen to the music. Mm -hmm. And that would create the idea that was in my head of what the music of Cuba could be in, um, in a musical, which means that being in a musical means that it needs to be a little bit more accessible than say, to the masses than say, what you hear there, okay, uh, and it has to, has to be fun, uh, has to be functional, 
Okay. So, so the, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna, yeah. I was just gonna play a little bit of, of the music, but before I do, can you can you give me a hint at this story? Just a little. I mean, Cuba more, amor being love, but can you give me just a little uh, and set up the scene that um, you sent me, the little clip that you sent me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so in uh, Cuba more is basically is a story of uh, two Americans going to Cuba and falling in love with two Cubans, um, each falling in love with, a, with, a, with somebody uh, in Cuba. And, um, and the spirits and the essence of the, of the, of the island and the nation um, and social politics uh, brought, that brought them together also served as obstacles to them finding you know, a true, true understanding of love and, and at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also the idea of in life, there are two things that are very important. Love, which is, which is personified by the Orisha Oshun um, mm -hmm. in the Afro-Cuban Lukumi tradition, and, um, and choice, which is personified by the Orisha of Alegba, uh, okay. who's the guardian of the crossroads. In this, in this uh, song, okay. I have to make sure that I get this right, um, the young gentleman who Maria is, who's a Cuban, the young gentleman, American gentleman who she's fallen for, um, she's beginning to find out things about him and he's, everything that he does, he ruins as the American. Like every oh. situation that he touches, he just kind of completely messes up um, mm -hmm. earnestly or makes poor choices and she finally gets angry at him and says, why are you here? And okay. this is that moment. Okay, so this is, this is the instrumental version that you sent me, because that would... You know, okay. this is it. This piece is interesting because this is one of the first time that I wrote a song before I could actually play it. Okay. Um, so I wrote this song um, and I'm sitting at the piano and my fingers just, when I put my hand on the, my, particularly my right hand on the piano, it falls down in a certain place. And so all of the intervals, da 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 there, there's like a sixth and an octave or whatever. And, um, and um, so, that's where I base the idea off uh, from. Mm -hmm. um, my prof my advisor, um, a gentleman named Randall Ng, he's a really wonderful, wonderful composer in his own right and uh, a really, really supportive teacher um, at NYU. He said, he when, when I present, when I, up until this point, and this piece is really kind of in the middle of the show, um, he had said, he prior to this, he said, he had told me, you know, I was excited when you were said you were going to do a jazz, sh uh, a Cuban show with Afro Latin jazz and things like that. And he's like, and in a way that didn't sound mean because it was so earnest. He was like, I just expected more, oh. <laughs> <laughs> more passion, more vibrancy, more something. Mm. And so I was like, huh, okay. And so I came back uh, about three or four days later with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like, see, this is what this is. It's not there yet, <laughs> but <laughs> the direction that this is what I was expecting. Something with a little bit of sauce and some 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 fire, because and I'm because I had said to him when he asked why Cuba, I was like, I said because the passion of the island. Mm -hmm. Everybody is so passionate. Everything that is done with such, is done with such earnest passion. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had said, I didn't, I don't see it in your music. Okay. So that, that prompted me to write this. And so moving forward, this would become more of the palette of the show. Mm -hmm. And then I would rewrite everything that had preceded it. Okay. Um, but I think that that was one of the, the soundest pieces of advice that I, that I got from, from him that year. Yeah. Um, because he was, he was, he was right. Nice. When I look back at it, he was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's what teachers are supposed to do. They're supposed to push you, <laughs> ideally. Yeah. And you're an educator. You're an educator yourself. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, where are you teaching now? Or I mean, I know things are kind of weird these days, but I mean, are you still teaching at this moment? Uh, I'm not. I don't know when is this airing live. I'm. I'm in the yes. process. Of, okay. I'm in the process of moving to another position. Okay. And um, which I can tell you about offline. Okay. Um, but it's uh, it's a wonderful um, it's a wonderful uh, step in the progression, and mm -hmm. I'm excited about what that's going to be. But uh, to make a short story shorter, uh, mm -hmm. back in academia into the Ivory Towers, um, I'm okay. going to be working at a, a really really good school, and I'm excited about the work that I'm going to be doing, and mm -hmm. what and along with the work uh, as a musical theater composer mm -hmm. and writer um, and practitioner, I'm also going to be working and teaching about diversity, race, and inclusion in performance Good. from a historic standpoint. And I think that that's really important. And I'm excited that um, this institution has decided to, to look at that in the history of the art form, because I think you can't really leave it out. Right. Well, certainly, I mean, um, you know, if you know the history of musical theater at all, you know that um, the people like UB Blake and, you know, these people who, uh, perhaps we don't associate, I mean, I guess we associate music theater with Stephen Sondheim, you know, like, uh, and pe I mean, people further back than that, obviously, but um, mm -hmm. that's that's a very important piece. And that uh, sort of ties into, um, you know, I posted something on Facebook that was, had you heard of Juneteenth? And I know um, a lot of people hadn't. Now I grew up in Canada, um, so I didn't know it when I was growing up, but I certainly found out not long after I moved to the States, which was eons ago. So, um, you know, that addressing that hole in um, the education is such an important thing. So I'm glad to hear you're going to be, you're going to be doing that. And, um, and talking about mentioning the past of musical theater, I mean, you know, when Broadway went dark with the COVID uh, crisis, I know um, I saw your uh, online um, little presentation about Kuba Moore and you said that you were in the process of workshopping something new and then everything sort of fell apart. Um, and what are your feelings about moving forward? Um, like, are you seeing signs of life or just kind of crossing both fingers or what's going on with that? Um, I, it's going to move forward. I mean, yeah. I was, um, a gentleman spoke to it who's an artistic director of, I leave the, uh, the Guthrie. Um, but, but theater has existed for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Last summer I was in, I was in um, Greece. I was in Athens and I saw the theater um, the first theater the, in, 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 um, in um, Athens. And so you look and you're saying, you know, plague, uh, war, world wars, it still survives. So life yeah. reform is always going to have a place. Mm -hmm. uh, now the grand, the grand scope of time is long in comparison to our lives, which are sure. at their longest are short. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, but I believe that, I, I believe that we are going to work our way back. We just got a call to uh, to begin development on one of our works, which okay. I'm excited about. Yeah. And um, so things are beginning. We're beginning to put the feelers out there to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the we adjust, and we are creatures of you know we're products of our environment, so we can we can adjust. I hope that uh, we don't adjust too far into this Zoom world of performance. Uh -huh. um, but knowing that we can is at the same time um, gratifying and terrifying. <laughs> um, but I think ultimately uh, going to the theater is a social experience. Yeah. And we and people enjoy experiencing things with others because we are social people. So I feel like things are going to open up within the next year to, uh, year to 18 months to two years. I think that we'll be hopefully back to getting close to some semblance of what we know is normal, although the new normal may be a bit different. Yeah. But I feel like, I, I, I believe that that'll come. Mm -hmm. And since musical theater takes takes a turtle's age to get produced and developed anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we'll be ready. 
Okay, that sounds good. Words open, we'll have something. Okay, and um, so the next thing that you're working on, um, let me be sure I'm correct. So that's Berlin. Is that the thing that you're working on? Are you two things you're working on right now? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's they couldn't be more different. Um, okay. Which is a lot of fun um, for both of us. Uh, secret thing about me, I like '80s pop music. You okay. Know, I do. I like. That's it. All right. Yeah, I like 80s music. I say there, there are no guilty pleasures as long as nobody gets hurt. So that's nope. okay. Nope. <laughs> yeah, you know, okay, no, but I, I'll take that. I'll, <laughs> that's the new status update. <laughs> right? <laughs> play them something that's just depressingly corny. But, but <laughs> it's, um. so we've been working on this piece and we workshopped it at Theater Works a number of years ago. Um, mm -hmm. That's root, based on um, or rooted in uh, the story of the father of Alexander Dumas. Oh. Um, the Black Count um, yeah. that was written about um, not too long ago in a mm -hmm. biography. Mm -hmm. And it's such a swashbuckling tale and such an amazing story. Yeah. And people who, you know, it's the idea that people who are hum tremendous historical figures cross paths. Uh, uh, Chevalier de Saint Georges is, is, um, is what taught him swordsmanship. Mm -hmm. and, um, and just in, just in case there are people who, I don't know who's listening, but I mean, who don't know who the Chevalier is, because I, I find him one of the more fascinating figures in history. Absolutely. Could you want to talk a little bit about the Chevalier? Chevalier is, is, is I, and this is me and my writing partner, we are, because we're such friends, we can go back and forth and have really dra knock down drag outs. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, Chevalier deserves his own story because yeah. he's just so fantastic for, particularly for his time. He was, um, he was uh, 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 what was considered mulatto, but he was biracial at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and this was at a time in France where they're rediscovering what the idea and the rules and the ideas and principles of a republic are. Mm -hmm. And who has, who has, uh, who, who is a man. And so with the, with the writings of the rights of man, they provided space for um, some of everybody. And the Chevalier was, it's hard to put him in, it's one part courtesan, one part uh, a military man. He was a military officer. Yeah. He was also um, the most, he was the most famous virtuosic swordsman um, yeah. with, with, and with fencing in the country. Mm -hmm. He was also the, the most highly respected violinist in, mm -hmm. the, in the country. He was a composer and he composed concertos. He was, he tried to and um, waged a campaign to become the director of the, of the Paris Opera House. I mean, this is just a, he dined and, and was in the company in the, um, of, of kings of both England and France. Um, and he was just a very larger than life figure and yeah. cultured in a way that presented in a, in a way that allowed him to move into many circles, but also be ostracized by a number of circles because he was a person of color right. um, at that time. And we can equate the what was going on in, Paris, in France at that time to what was going on in during Recon, early, earlier part of Reconstruction where you had former slaves that were occupying rep, state, rep, uh, federal, federal positions um, for that piece of time. And then Napoleon came and changed everything. But right. he's a very, very interesting individual. So we're anyway, this story we're looking at, um, we're looking at how to tell the story of, of uh, Thomas, Thomas Alexander Dumas and, um, and with Chevalier and with some of his other figures through the eyes of his son, um, Alexander Dumas. Hmm, that and sounds really interesting. Be a lot of fun. It allows me to stretch my classical chops and going into playing around with the, the those ideas and although my music the music sounds more baroque than classical uh, mm -hmm. we'll work out the we'll work out the periods and all of that but yeah. fun. it's okay. a fun thing to work with okay so let me play a little bit of en garde yeah <laughs> Yeah. So 
is is that is that um going to be a song or is that background music like uh it's going to be a song and in that song actually um Chevalier is teaching uh, Thomas Alexandre Dumas is uh, how to how to fence, how to use his sword as a tool of precision rather than 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 blunt force. Okay. Um, which would be the blueprint of which would become the blueprint of how his very small group of military men were able to take on armies multiple times their size because. Mm -hmm. The intricate instrument. It's a it's a, it's an int intricate eh, intricate instrument of okay. and And um, yeah, it's 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 a fun piece. It bounces around a lot. My right hand is obviously still stronger than my left hand, but mm -hmm. it's a lot of it's. I love the idea and the playfulness of the music of the period, and I love a good period piece. Poofy shirts and, and <laughs> I, I, I I do I love that. So okay yeah. okay. Yeah no, that sounds like a very that's a very exciting idea. So yeah, and then. Um, at the same time, you're doing a piece about Berlin, which yeah. is completely different. Completely different. So Berlin, um, uh, I've worked with children for a number of years. And um, um, and so I used to write a show every year when I was working um, with children to keep my musical theater writing chops, continuing, you know, continuing to use those aspects of my mind. And, um, and the show, we decided to make the show larger into a feature because uh, it was rooted in the students learning about the Berlin Wall. Hmm. And so this past summer, I was also in Germany. I went to Berlin for the first time, actually, um, to see where my father was stationed. My father had been in, stationed in Germany when he was in the military <laughs> and seeing how it had changed from the pictures and this and the other. And so being there, I looked at him like, this would make a great show because the stories that could have happened at this time, the espionage, the, 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 West on one side of the wall, the East on the other side of the wall, and um, and the way that our we export culture to the rest of the world, mm. which is interesting. I feel like there's a dichotomy there. Mm -hmm. um, the way that we export the idea of freedom, particularly given you know uh, uh, our history, yeah. but we export the idea of freedom through our culture. Mm -hmm that allows people to liber kind of liberate themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm thinking of what was that music like back then? And the music was fun. Mm -hmm. They were liberated by the fact that we were ideally having fun. And so I wanted, to, I went back to the eighties music that was so fun and so poppy and all of that. Mm -hmm. And it's a, lot of, it's a lot of fun. These are the moves, these, this is music that was in clubs at the time. Mm -hmm. And so it just so happens that my writing partner and I, um, both of our parents were in the service. They were both stationed in Germany. Mm -hmm. James was actually spent his childhood in Germany, and mm -hmm. so he's fluent in German. Okay, which works out because he can sing in German, and I can't. So <laughs> he translated the words. I don't know if he got them right or not, but, but okay. So it's a lot of fun. Okay, so I'll play a little bit of that, and this is wildly different. <laughs> <laughs> Meine Kunden sind top und ich stürze an der guten HMP. Gibt einen Rapper, die alle mit Schwierigkeiten und Fällen. Der Mittel ist kalt, die Gefährdung ist leider auf sich und aus du. Aber an diesem Tag steht er auf und sagt, es ist Zeit schon so, so this reminds me, um, this sort of takes me back to, um, I was having a conversation yesterday, I've been talking a lot <laughs> lately, um, it was on the Hamp Songs Foundation um, site and it was Thomas Hampson and Louise Toppin and, and I and Bill Banfield and Mark Clegg and Clegg, sorry, and um, there was a, a a thing about um, you know black composers and in, in increasing the classical music uh, representation of black composers mm -hmm. and letting these voices into the room. And um, the point that that I made, which I thought was um, well, I mean, on the one hand, it's like increasing the soundscape, so to speak, and the idea that you know music that is rooted in 
the blues and the history of, you know, whatever black music is, is, um, you know, valid um, expression of classical music and these sorts of things should be, you know, encouraged and incorporated. And um, the, what I said was that, you know, I'm black all day long every day. And so anything I write is black music because I'm black. <laughs> and regardless of um, the influences, it just sort of has to do with what seems to speak to me in like, if I'm writing uh, music for words or whatever, you know, um, I have a wide variety of experiences. And so, you know, so if someone heard that, they wouldn't necessarily say, oh, black composer, but you're serving a particular story. And, you know, that's music that for whatever, you know, is part of what you enjoy and have enjoyed and, you know, reflects different aspects of you. And, you know, it's something that I also think when I'm, I read books by black authors or um, just the whole idea of, um, we still need to write wonderful stories like Colson Whitehead's Very Hard to Read, Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. or um, other stories that are set in the civil rights era, set in all these um, periods that unfortunately we seem to loop and repeat over and over again in some way. Um, but, you know, I, I like the idea of just, you know, whatever it is that you feel that you want to do, it doesn't have to be anything in particular because you're black it's just you know i'm doing this this fits with what i'm you know this other vision i mean i'm living my life i'm just you know this speaks to me or it is what it is and i'm writing it because you know i don't have to prove anything to anybody that was a long-winded thing but anyway no no i i i, com I wholeheartedly agree i i think that all of our stories are unique mm -hmm. but you know i our blackness is irrefutable. I mean, you can just look at it and ha half of who we are is the way that the world views us. So, and and our reaction to that affects who we are. Um, now that doesn't mean that we all have the same experiences or have to, our art has to reflect what we consider black, you know, and, and from the purest sense, so much of everything that we listen to has its origins in um, people of the enslaved. So, uh, so, I think that there is there are ways that we play with it because we're in an age where branding is such a big thing, and I'm saying that as I'm sitting sure. in in the in the office of my of a branding uh, entity. Right. Agency. Um, but it it it's important uh, a important part of everything, and so for branding, we are going into a world where the hyphenate or the multi hyphenate is now in vogue, where in the past it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I think that we should take advantage of it. And I'm wholeheartedly enjoying being able to do a classical piece on one hand, which people might not associate with black music, and then doing a, uh, a post new wave piece mm -hmm. on the other hand, still black. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it's completely honest and it's completely a part of, part of me. Yeah, I've done mm -hmm. hip hop work and nobody argues that. Right. right. So why one argue one or the other? My training is in one place. My experiences are another, and and it is what it is. And and it's telling true stories. Mm -hmm. It's a story of who I am or what the story that I want to tell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been fortunate, I think, that I've been able to access it, access the sounds of it, um, which may seem make it seem very, um, may make it seem very. Uh, um, Diver having a, 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 an ability to be diverse. Mm -hmm. Really, it's just going into one part of my mind and thinking, or one of my experiences, and saying, you know what, I want to access this. Or mm -hmm. I want to access that. And yeah. I think we all should and all have the right and the means to do so. We should. And nobody, and who is anybody to say what's real and what's true or not, or what's valid or not? Yeah. I mean, I, I think my. My one um, determining factor is if you have people who are constantly rejecting um, their culture or denigrating their culture, their background, and um, you know you have this sort of chauvinist idea that well because it's more European it's somehow better. I mean I think that's one thing that sort of attitude. But I think that um, you know I I just I don't want to be put in a box. I mean I only have one short life to live. And, um, you know, I know who I am and I know, yeah, I just know who I am. And so, yeah, I, I appreciate the freedom, that, that freedom to just 
you know, be who you want to be musically. But well, since you touched on the Clever Agency, um, let's talk about the Clever Agency. I um, saw Milando Jones, who is the, he was the founder of the agency or one of the founders? Uh, he was the founder. The founder in 2012. And he just got a shout out in Black Enterprise Magazine. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about it and how you got involved with it? Uh, sure. Milando had, um, had just uh, arrived back to the United States after uh, spending time living in England, um, in London. And uh, we were looking, and this was still during the during the, the recession years. Um, and uh, he had finished; he had wrapped up his MFA studies um, um, after getting his degree much earlier in um, in business admin. And um, I was just coming out of school, or in the process of coming out of of, of uh, grad school. And um, and we're trying to figure out what comes next because all of the artists, when when the economy falls apart, the artists feel it first. Of course, yeah. and so a lot of artists were leaving, and a lot of artists were, and those of us that were still sticking it out, were trying to figure out how we could evolve for the market. And one of the things that we were able to do is come up with ideas to make ways for people to bring their art to the people, because it's enough being an artist and being good at your craft. Trying to figure out how to communicate what you're what you're doing to others that's another another skill in and of itself. Right. A lot of art, a lot of amazing artists aren't good salespeople, mm -hmm. but we never hear about them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of the impetus. And we were looking at how we wanted to press forward and Milando decided to actually take the, take the plunge and, and solve that dilemma. And so he began, he created the clever agency and began um, using the people that were closest to him in his network at the time, and that was myself, a gentleman named Brooks Stevenson, um, and later a gentleman named uh, Ramon, Ariel. And so we would come up with ideas and concepts and people would come to us and friends of ours who we've known in the field would come and say, oh, I have this idea. And we'd say, well, let's hear it. Well, let's see what we can do. To the point where fun people began to come to us with their mm -hmm. ideas. And, um, and because of our different energies and the way that we process things, we complemented each other, which is just beneficial in a company, something that's necessary in a company. Sure. And, um, and, it, and it grew out of that and it continued to grow, morph into a content development agency uh, that works with artists, social entrepreneurs, and 501c3s and different organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and largely in, in communication, figuring out how they want to communicate this idea, this dream or their uh, dream or goal. Mm -hmm. And it became fun. And actually it took mm -hmm. me away from music for a while because it was a way to use my mind in a different way. Mm -hmm. Same things that I use to process creating music or art or theater or dance um, and use that processing, working towards communicating other people's ideas in mm -hmm. languages that they may not, may not see. And, mm -hmm. um, and so we have an idea, let's, let's create a lifestyle, lifestyle brand. And so we went in that direction. And, um, well, um, and you mean like you created a lifestyle brand from scratch or someone came to you with something and you said, okay, let's move in the direction of making this into a lifestyle brand or? We, so we were uh, uh, working in terms of using uh, tools of media to mm -hmm. develop people's ideas for the whatever platform or idea that they were working on. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to add on to things. So we're like, mm -hmm. oh, we're doing all this traveling. Well, let's write, we can write, let's write about what we see. Okay. And let's document, let's document the process that we use to, of the, the process that we undergo to mm -hmm. create these great campaigns or these great ideas. Mm -hmm. And then people started coming to us for that. And mm -hmm. so the, the scope of the organization and the company grew, particularly as we became more adept at, 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 at uh, using the people who we knew from the industry and, and uh, acquiring more collaborators. And so we have this great, as Melanda would say, Motley crew of amazing artists and entrepreneurs and, and just really, really smart, amazing people that we can, we can pull from or work with or collaborate with and say, we have an idea. So we connect as much as we create platforms and build. And mm -hmm. it keeps us thinking and looking forward, one, and also allows us to always be thinking about how we can get I, our idea, whatever it is, to the people that you want to receive your message. 
Hmm. And so it's really, and, and it's, it's business, but it's it, not, but it's business and it's fun. So okay. like we're doing it to make money, although it's a business, we want, we do it to make money. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but, but it's one of those things that we actually enjoy because all of our clients are really collaborators. Hmm. And so we grow with every campaign. We have something else to put in our pocket in our mind to say, wow, now we can use this as a way to solve somebody else's dilemma or challenge. And it's really, it's really exciting. We're all artists, so we incorporate our artistry into a lot of the campaigns that are solely ours, like the Clever Studio series, um, the uh, podcast series that we're looking at coming up. Um, just a number of different ideas that we're putting for, forward, independent creative projects like short films, um, mm -hmm. all of these things, music videos. We've already, we're already doing these things and now we have to create new dreams because okay. We've just been fortunate to attain a lot of them. Even in a time like this, where a lot of places are closing, we've been we've been able to survive. Knock, mm -hmm. on, knock on wood, if I can find it. Yeah. Um, because um, as long as people keep dreaming, people keep coming to us with ideas, and okay. we love dreamers because we're dreamers. Yeah. So, what's your podcast about? You say, um, like, or is there a particular topic, or just whatever comes to mind? Um. It's, it's still coming together and we're acquiring conversations that we've had with people, but a lot of it is looking at in, uh, interesting, interesting people uh, of color who, uh, who you may know of or you may not, but seeing, getting to understand their process. Mm -hmm. and it's more so looking at people who do day-to-day -day things. Like the, the people that you see on the, on the, that are, that live a normal life, what we would consider a normal life as opposed yeah. to a celebrity life. Mm -hmm. And then mixing those in with people who you think live maybe a celebrity life, but seeing how close and how similar their mindsets and the way they go about things are. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. elevating, elevating the perception of some people and bringing down to earth the, the persona of others to recognize that we all share the same, the same lane, you know, we're yeah. all, same level in one in one form or another, and it's really interesting. Many of the people are artists and social social entrepreneurs and think people who we who are in our orbit who we just <laughs> are really amazing. Yeah, um, and hopefully it's interesting. We can make it interesting enough yeah. for people to tune in. Yeah, um, but um, we're still putting it together and still putting the ideas of it together. Okay, um, we'll still be studying, so we'll be studying this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and. Um, but uh, just 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 having conversations with folks because it's really it's really fun to hear other people's process because it helps enrich ours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's something I was raised with actually. Just the idea that um, you know you don't look down on people, you don't look up to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a sense, I mean I can't say I don't look up to anybody because I do admire some of the accomplishments that uh, people have made. But on the other hand, I mean just that core idea that you know, no matter where you end up so-called in um, society's view, because there are these stratifications that are really artificial as far as, you know, some people are perceived as having more value because they did X or Y. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I, I love that idea. I love that. So, um, you know, so as far as this, I mean, the marketing thing, I mean, I, I know as a a musician. I mean, it's. I was hoping that at this generation, people are no longer thinking of it this way. But yeah, the main focus was okay. Just be as good as you possibly can be, and then everything else will fall into place. Which is not really how it works at all. Mm -hmm. So um, it's you know, it's cool that you have agencies that are people who really understand from the inside out. I mean, I've found myself being forced to be an entrepreneur because you know my son, who is a visual artist and, and is on the mm -hmm. autism spectrum, mm -hmm. and so he's not going to market himself. And I'm, uh, it, it feels like a foreign country because that wasn't something that I planned to find out anything about. So um, on the one hand, um, it's keeping all the balls in the air. I try to market myself and try to market him. On the other hand, it's um, discovering a whole new, you know, some territory. And and you know, there's there is some fun to it, even though it feels like a lot is on the line. So um, anyway, it's, it, and so that kind of um, idea of, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's cool that you guys just kind of found each other. It sounds like you just, nobody was seeking anybody or how did that work out? Cause I'm still not sure how you all got together in the first place and, and you know. One of our founders who was passed on and that was a bit, that was a very big blow and to our, our company. In fact, me, uh, myself and Melanda were, 
having a conversation about um, about him um, a few minutes uh, a few minutes ago. Okay. Um, but he was a connector. Okay. He connected to everybody in the world, and and yeah, he was a connector. Yeah. Um, and so just being out with him and being in Brooklyn and New York at a, at that time during from, during I call it call it the neo soul years. Mm -hmm. um, was was just a um was just a really really pivotal time um because there are so many wonderful people who are floating around the same place at the same time and um so we we would just go to parties we see people at parties we see people at events or at a block party or we live in the same neighborhood because many people that arrived in new york even though brooklyn is large they li we lived in one of three neighborhoods because mm -hmm. that's what we afford um, and yeah. so we're all young, hungry, and driven and trying to find our way. And that pool of people would get cold over time by circumstance, by hardship, by whatever. Mm -hmm. And and we kind of stayed. And mm -hmm. we, we were friends first. And mm -hmm. it boils down to uh, Brooke, Milando, and myself. We were just, we were good friends first. Mm -hmm. um, Ramon was a, was a, a mentee of Milando's. Mm -hmm. And um, when Milando was uh, working, uh, doing his, some, of, some of his work, where he did his grad work at, uh, the, at SVA, which is a very, very res well-respected school of uh, visual art and design. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, so there are people that are in, our, in, in your circle, in your world. Mm -hmm. And we start talking about survival and things like that, and, and those deep conversations that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to start leaning on each other to help us with whatever we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what our company became. Mm -hmm. People would come to us because we're friends. We know each other. Oh yeah, you remember Vince? Oh, you remember Milando? Oh, Brooke, oh, Brooke, Brooke knows everybody. And, yeah. and oh, well, you know what? I know somebody that can do something for you on this. Let me reach out. Or, well, we can work on something like that. So that's kind of how it happened. It happened very, very organically. Okay. Um, and I think that's good because at the end of the day, we enjoy spending time with one another. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you can get caught in the weeds of, of the work and the, the tedium of video editing, okay. which can be a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but spending time with one another is, a lot of, is, is also a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. and looking back at a project and saying, see, I did that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. also makes you feel good. So that's kind of how things came together. Brooklyn was just one of those places at that time mm -hmm. where a lot of great minds and a lot of great energies and ideologies came together and a lot of, you know, in a lot of ways, some brilliant work, art companies, uh, institutions kind of came out of that. And ideally, uh, we got priced out of Brooklyn, <laughs> like a lot of people, and we're in Jersey City. But Jersey City is, is growing into a fertile, a fertile patch of land that ideally may have what Brooklyn had between 2000 and 2012-ish. Okay. Yeah, I, I lived in Crown Heights. Where did you live? I lived in I, when I moved to New York. I lived in Crown Heights. Did you? I lived yeah. on I lived on Montgomery between Nostrand and Rogers. I lived on Union between. Um, oh boy, I'm blanking. It was the Union stop though. It was right like around the corner from that stop, and then yeah. you know walking distance to the Brooklyn Museum. Mm -hmm. And my um, she's not you know distant cousin who I called my aunt was a docent at the Brooklyn Museum. So yeah, that, that was my neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Brooklyn Museum right now is where you want to go to be see, to see and be seen. All the people that we would end up at the Brooklyn Museum for first Saturday or something like that, and it's and it's still kind of like going back. It's going to homecoming of sorts. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, so and I lived in Bed Stuy for a long time. Okay. Um, so Brooklyn has changed a lot. It's not the same Brooklyn, and there's a lot to lament in that. Mm -hmm. But you know, things evolve and things change and we have to yeah. allow, allow for that. And I think that it is special to the people that were my age now and yeah. it will be that. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, we're in Jersey City and th there's a fertility and an energy and a diversity here that we're excited about. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we have our own space, which is not easy to, to have, but it, it opens, it's opened a new realm of possibilities. We have- sure. Blue screen, green screen. We have. We can do a lot of video editing. We can do a lot of things here. So we're yeah. just really excited about it. And it's 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 fun. It it's good to complement my the other work that I'm doing. 
Yeah. So that I always have a reprieve from my mind. I get too caught in, in the forest over here. Mm -hmm. I have something over here that can kind of massage another side of my brain, which, sure. which allows me to maintain some semblance of sanity. I understand. <laughs> so, um, I mean, do you see the current moment, whether it's um, COVID or whether it's, you know, the protests and and um, Black Lives Matter sort of ascending to the lips of everybody for at least a few minutes? Um, do you see any art of, you know, are you guys thinking about writing anything that captures this moment or do you sort of, I mean, has that stimulated anything? You're just trying to get through it. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> where it stimulates a lot and we're also trying to get through it. Um, yeah. There's a lot to be said and, and a lot of, when you're trying to capture a moment, you, you have to step back and just look at it and watch yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And so we are watching it and seeing, and then make sure we don't get too caught up in it that we end up in, <laughs> in the middle of it in a way that we don't want to. Mm -hmm. but, um, but there's this version of this bubbling over Mm -hmm. um, seems a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and I hope that's the case. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, the cycles are getting smaller because the information can move a lot faster and, yeah. and because everybody has access to a cell phone now. So, mm -hmm. um, and now we, it's not just us advocating for ourselves. Yeah. So that's something that I want to talk about. Yeah. Because I see, like you know, all these bestsellers that are um, related to Black history and people uh, tripping over themselves to make Juneteenth a holiday <laughs> and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I have to admit, I, I, I hope that the white hot focus, white hot, whatever you want to call it, anyway, the focus um, isn't so intense that people, you know, get fatigued with the whole thing and then it just kind of gradually drifts back. But anyway, I, I ask, I, I mention that to everybody I've talked to because I. I, I skew a little pessimistic sometimes, but I'm hoping that, again, people talk about a tipping point. So I'm hoping that some real change results and that people can't just um, willy nilly decide to close all the precincts in Georgia. And, you know, that because once that law fell, then, you know, everybody sort of jumped on taking advantage. So we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll definitely see what happens. Yeah. But anyway, well, we have like three minutes uh, in my scheduled uh, discussion. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to bring out about what, what else you're doing that you want to mention? Like you mentioned short film. Um, do you have, is that just an idea? Do you have some things in the works right now? Well, one of our collaborators, a brilliant, um, a brilliant uh, uh, choreographer and good friend, um, Andre M. Zachary, who does a lot of our video, um, uh, video campaigns um, and who, whose works are really, really beginning to receive, uh, receive attention and acclaim. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, is a filmmaker and he mm -hmm. makes, he's done a number of shorts. And, um, and so we've been looking at ways to take his view of things and ideas and expand upon them because we have, we have the resources and now we have the, the, the ideas and the, the means of doing, doing that. We have mm -hmm. a team that can, that can actually develop that. Mm -hmm. um, and many people in our circle have been, have been looking at ways for the art form to evolve into the digital. Mm -hmm. and, Film is a natural progression, but and it works for him because he's studied multimedia design and filmmaking. So yeah, um, so we're looking at ways that we can create works that don't necessarily have to be feature length. Okay. Um, at this point, yeah. But can look at giving stories that may be nonlinear, mm -hmm. um, uh, with a budget uh, that allows for us to tell the story that we want to tell mm -hmm. without necessarily needing to be gargantuan because it allows yeah. for the artistry not to fall into the products, you know, yeah. that we use to make our stories better. Yeah. Um, and with really smart people and, and brilliant artists, uh, which um, all of these people are and which we would like to make our, assume that we are to some degree. Yeah. Um, we just want to expand the scope of what an artistic mind can do mm -hmm. in the market. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's one of the, that's one of the avenues. That's wonderful. I mean, I looked and I last thing I'm going to say is that when I looked at your website, I saw everything. I saw a rainbow and I saw um, gender diversity. And um, and I I know that, um, you know, the way that you're describing all your collaborators that, you know, it's not just, well, let's check this box. You know, it's just a bunch of really, really talented people and no one is excluded. And I think that is the 
template that hopefully we can get to one day, a bunch of really, really talented people, no one is excluded, you know, if you know what to, you're doing, you're in, doesn't matter what you look like or what your name is or any of that stuff. So, so yeah. I, yeah, well, I applaud you and, and more, 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 more power to you. Thank and you. Um, I can't wait to see uh, what you come up with when, I don't know when the last time I actually had a real conversation with, well, I was in New York a, a while ago, but it's been a while. So I'm looking forward to the next time I talk, God only knows what you'll be up to. It's really exciting. So thank you. Well, thank thanks you. for giving me an hour. I know that you've been busy, so I, I really appreciate it. And um, oh, well, it's a pleasure. It's yeah. a pleasure to uh, to catch back up. We definitely have to not have it be so long. Exactly, I agree. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day, and thank thanks you again. Too. Okay. Bye. Bye.